welcome back in this lecture i will discuss frictional properties of polymer molecules in dilute solution and give you a overview of um, polymer molecular weight determination techniques we have started discussing characterization techniques of um, polymers and in the last lecture we have discussed chain dimension now frictional polym properties of polymers also related to chain dimensions as we can basically uh, anticipate that if the polymer chains becomes larger in size then the viscosity of the polymer solution will be higher which means the dimension of polymer chains had very close relationship with the frictional properties with the of the polymer solution and let us discuss uh, frictional properties of polymer in this uh, lecture we will consider dilute solution because uh, for a concentrated solution uh, we are not interested at this moment because most of our polymer characterization techniques are done in dilute solution and we are learning this this uh, frictional properties uh, to which will help us to understand the techniques which are used to determine polymer molecular weight now there are two types of polymer molecules can be possible in solution one is free draining free draining polymer molecule in this case solvent molecules flow past each segment of the chain so basically solvents do not intermingle with the polymer coil in fact we don't have polymer coil in this particular case if i have a, a rod like polymer structure or very short polymer structure then it basically flows flows through the solvent without uh, interacting too much with the solvent molecule so basically solvent molecules flow past each other each segment of the chain and this behavior dominates for the very short chain and highly elongated rod like molecules now this this polymer molecules are not very frequently uh, encountered most of our regular synthetic polymers are not uh, free draining type of molecules so we will not discuss this uh, topic uh, to a higher extent most of our synthetic polymers they behave non draining polymer molecules in solution which means solvent molecules within the coiled polymer structure move along with the polymer molecule and this behavior dom is dominates for flexible long chain polymer molecules which is which are the generally encountered polymers in our uh, most of the applications now in this case non draining polymer molecules the molecule or the polymer molecule can be represented by one equivalent impermeable hydrodynamic particle that is one which has same frictional coefficient as the polymer molecule let me explain this little uh, more say if this white one is the polymer coil now just like any other molecule this will have brownian motion and it will have a so basically it will undergo translational motion through the solvent molecule now when it moves it will move along with this this uh, small solvent molecules which are shown here so when this polymer coil actually travels across the solvent it moves along with this solvent molecules which are present in the coil now we can represent this as a impermeable hydrodynamic particle like this 
spherical particle which has the same frictional coefficient as this polymer molecule. So, in this case we are considering an equivalent rigid or impermeable hydrodynamic particle which has same frictional coefficient as a real coiled polymer chain which moves along with the solvent molecules. Now, for this hydrodynamic par particle we have corresponding volume which we call hydrodynamic volume which is represented at V h and we have corresponding hydrodynamic radius and hydrodynamic diameter. So, when you talk about hydrodynamic size then we can talk about either hydrodynamic radius, diameter or volume. And dynamic light scattering technique is actually used to determine the size hydrodynamic size of a polymer particle or polymer molecule in solution. Now, we will talk about Einstein equation for viscosity of a suspended rigid non interacting sphere as we described in the last slide. We talked about a impermeable hydrodynamic particle effectively which does not interact with the solvent molecule. The frictional coefficient of which is same as the real polymer chain along with the solvent molecule. So, the Einstein equation is given by this where this is the coefficient of viscosity of the solution and this is the coefficient of viscosity of the solvent and phi 2 is the volume fraction of the solute which is polymer in this case. So, this is uh, the suspending uh, medium which is the solvent in this case. Now, specific viscosity we know specific viscosity eta s p is given by eta by eta 0 minus 1. So, from there if we know this expression of eta specific uh, viscosity as this then we can rearrange the this expression as this, where C is the polymer concentration in terms of mass per unit volume, M is the molar mass, Na is the Avogadro number and V h is as described in the last slide hydrodynamic volume, which is the volume of rigid non interacting sphere. Now, we know Intrinsic viscosity which is given by intrinsic viscosity is given by limit C tends to 0 eta S p by C. So, if we rearrange this expression we bring C in this uh, denominator then we can write intrinsic viscosity as this expression where we are writing V h hydrodynamic volume when concentration is tending to 0. So, we can write because we are talking about very dilute solution then we will not write this uh, subscript C tend to 0 now onwards we will write simply hydrodynamic volume. So, the intrinsic viscosity is proportional to the ratio of hydrodynamic volume divided by the molar mass. So, intrinsic viscosity is inversely related to the density of the random coil because this is 1 over density effectively 1 over density of the random coil as the density increases the intrinsic viscosity goes down and vice versa. So, denser the coil volume smaller is the intensive viscosity and for a 
chain which has same molecular but lower hydrodynamic volume. In case we have a branched chain then for a given molecular weight we can have a lower volume hydrodynamic volume then the intrinsic viscosity will be smaller. Now, if you multiply it we can rearrange this expression take this uh, m to left hand side and we can get this expression whereas, now this shows that the multiplication of intrinsic viscosity and molecular weight or molar mass is proportional to the hydrodynamic volume. So, this term intrinsic viscosity multiplied by the molar mass depends only on the hydrodynamic volume. So, if there are two chains with same hydrodynamic volume irrespective of their chemical or structural differences if they could be branch they could be linear or they could be of different chemical nature, but if their hydrodynamic volumes are same then the their product of molar mass and intrinsic viscosity also would be same and this is, is the basis for universal calibration of GPC which we will talk in a later lecture. So, we can as if we have seen this expression before. So, we can say that intensive viscosity is proportional to V h by m. Now, hydrodynamic volume can be expressed as the radius of gyration it is like a, the, the radius of that hydrodynamic particle. So, the volume would be 4 thai 4 thai pi r cube. So, this is kind of r. So, this is hydrodynamic volume is proportional to the radius of gyration to the power 3. Now, we know this uh, this radius of gyration can be expressed as the unpart of size and the expansion factor. So, we can write in place of V h we can write this this term. So, instead of proportionality uh, we if you write equal then equal sign then we have a constant this is the constant and we have this same expression. Now, we can rearrange this this little bit take this within the bracket 3 by 2 and put 1 by 2 outside and we can further rearrange as this. So, radius of gyration divided by molecular weight to the power half and which is raised to 3. Now, we have seen in last class that this term is related proportional to the root mean square radi uh, end to end distance which is proportional to n to the power half n is the number of bonds. So, which is proportional to the molecular weight to the power half which means if we divide this with m to the power half then this would be a constant term. So, this means the term inside this bracket is constant. So, we can put this constant and this constant together make a new constant k and write the entire thing as k and write this to other quantity to write a expression like this. So, this is the constant which accommodating the entire these terms and I explained why this is a constant. This is this expression is called Flory-Fox equation. This is the expansion factor for 
radius of gyration. Now, for theta solvent, which is the which is the basically below which uh, we get pore solvent, and the chain dimension is minimum in theta solvent. So, for theta solvent, we know for theta solvent we have this uh, value of case as 1 as we have seen before. Now, for dilute solution I mean, when the solvent quality is good, this is actually proportional to m to the power 1 over 10, which means this term is uh, proportional to m to the power 3 by 10, which means when we talk about this two term, this two term would be proportional to m over 0.8. Now, this happens for solvent which is good solvent for this polymer. So, this is in this case for a poor solvent or theta solvent we have m to the power 0.5 and in this case we have m to the power 0.8. So, if you write instead of this two constant together, if you now take this together and write eta is equal to some other constant m to the power a, then a would be varying from 0.5 for a theta solvent to 0.8 for a expanded coil in a good solvent. Now, it can go beyond 0.8 when the polymers become elongated and rod like shape, but which is not very frequently observed in our case. So, the value of A would be between 0 0.8, 0 0.5 and 0.8 this is for the theta solvent or and this is for the good solvent when the polymer coil is expanded and this expression we call mark Hoeing equation. So, we can write as I explained this expression, this k is another constant, m is the molecular weight raised to the power a and k and a are constant for a particular polymer solvent temperature system, which means if any of these three quantity changes either temperature changes or solvent changes or polymer changes, the value of A and K would also change and we call this as Mark Hoeing equation. And later we will see that this molecular weight is actually M V which is a viscosity, viscosity average molecular weight and this will be utilized to determine this expression will be utilized to determine the molecular weight viscosity average molecular weight in the coming class or coming lecture. Now, in Mar Mark Wing equation which actually was derived later experimentally it was derived theoretically as we explained from Flory Fox equation as an empirical equation and k are constant for a given polymer solvent temperature system as I uh, described just now and the value is normally between 0 0.5 to 0.8 for a linear chain. For a elongated chain this can go beyond 0 0.8, but which is not a very frequently observed polymer chain. For theta condition and linear chain A is 0 0.5 as I described a few minutes back and K increases with increase in the value of A for flexible chain and typically this is the value for K. For branched molecule or branch polymer molecule the hydrodynamic volume occupies smaller volume 
for same molecular weight. Hence, the intrinsic viscosity becomes smaller which means A becomes smaller. So, A is kind of represent the, the expansion of the polymer coil. If you have a theta solvent then it is not expanded so value is 0 0.5, if you have a good solvent then it expands so it increases to 0 0.8 and so on. For a same molecular if we have a branch structure obviously the, the, the size will be hydrodynamic size will be lower which means A value should be lower. And the value of K and A for copolymers are very difficult to obtain, they are complicated. So, if we, we discussed before, so if we compare two chains, one is linear without any branch, another is uh, linear, uh, we, but we have branch which is shown in this color. Both are having same molecular weight, then we can compare between these two that they have same molecular weight, but hydrodynamic volume for this will be higher, this will be lower because of presence of branch and the segment and density of the coil this will be higher, it will be more dense coil and the, so intrinsic viscosity of this branch polymer will be lower compared to the linear without branch. And this is the factor which generally used to express the branching or extent of branching which is a ratio of the intrinsic viscosity of the branched structure and linear structure having same molecular weight and higher is the branching it becomes lower and lower compared to 1. If there is no branch then it will be equals to 1. So, this G prime is the value which generally used to describe or quantify the extent of branching in a polymer chain. So, just to repeat what we understood that with increasing chain length for a linear molecule density decreases, intrinsic viscosity goes up. If we increase the mass of a chain, so density increases keeping the length same, the density increases, intrinsic viscosity decreases. If we increase the stiffness of the chain, the chain becomes more elongated, hence the intrinsic viscosity increases density goes down and as we discussed earlier if we add branches keeping molecular at same the density increases and intrinsic viscosity decreases. Now we talked about this hydrodynamic particle of a polymer chain. Now the translational diffusion coefficient of this isolated polymer chain is related to frictional coefficient by Einstein equation like this, where this is the diffusion coefficient, translational diffusion coefficient, K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the temperature and F naught is the frictional coefficient. Now these are linked, this frictional coefficient is linked to the hydrodynamic radius by Stokes equation. So, we can relate, if we found out the diffusion coefficient, we can use this expression to find out the size of the hydrodynamic particle which is done by using dynamic light scattering which I will discuss in a coming lecture. Now, let us move to the molecular weight determination techniques for polymer. And as I mentioned earlier, there's most of or almost all molecular weight determinations are done using dilute polymer solution. And that is why we were discussing or understanding the polymer behavior in dilute solution. So, while we use different techniques, we must remember or understand 
the different aspect of various techniques. For example, whether the technique is relative or absolute, relative in the sense that the reported molecular weight values are in relative to some other known values or it is absolute value. For relative measurement we require a calibration curve form polymer, polymer chains with known molecular weight, but for absolute technique we do not require any calibration curve from known molecular weight. You also need to know that what are the type or types of molecular weight data the technique can provide, whether any additional data it can provide and what are the limitation which includes what is the range of molecular weight of polymer which can be determined by that particular technique and what are the special cares should be taken to accurately measure the molecular weight. So, I will give you the overview of the various techniques. These first four techniques are based on measuring the colligatic properties of polymer solution which depends on the number of solute molecules in this case polymer molecules in solution. So, this gives these techniques gives number average molecular weight. Membrane osmometry is a absolute technique whereas, the other three are relative techniques. Now, this star means that although in principle it should be able to provide absolute value without any calibration curve, but in reality when we want to measure we require parameters which need to be optimized or calibrated using known molecular weight that is why these are relative techniques. And the molecular weight range for which these techniques are applicable are given here. And in all these techniques we need to be very careful about low molecular weight impurities because as I described that these are colligative properties and the property of this nature depends on number of molecules. Hence, if there are low molecular weight impurities which will effectively increase the number of molecules in solution to a much larger extent and there will be large error in these techniques. In group analysis is done using some chemical techniques and this also gives number average molecular weight and this is an absolute measurement technique polymers with low molecular weight especially uh, if it is the value is less than 15,000. And the restriction is that we need to have techniques which can quantify the n groups very effectively. So, to apply this technique of molecular weight determination we need to have polymers will distinct n groups which can be quantified by any chemical methods. And of course, care need to be taken about low molecular weight impurities. Similarly, ultra centrifugation techniques used to measure weight average molecular weight and z average molecular weight this is absolute technique and is only applicable for high molecular weight polymers. The disadvantage is that it takes too long time. Dilute solution viscometry is very uh, easy technique and it gives as we discussed in few minutes back 
it gives viscosity average molecular weight it is a relative technique this is not very suitable for low molecular weight polymers the advantage is that it is simple fast inexpensive inexpensive technique but disadvantage is that it is less precise and solvent dependent light scattering technique can be used to measure the weight average molecular weight and radius of gyration and also polymer solvent interaction parameter from which we can also get the parameter chi value of chi parameter this is absolute technique and this is applicable to medium to higher range of molecular weight disadvantage is that it is it does not give good accuracy for lower molecular weight polymers one of the best techniques for polymer molecular weight determination is gel permission chromatography or gpc it gives number average molecular weight weight average molecular weight and also the entire distribution of molecular weights which which indirectly gives the dispersity gel permission chromatography can be technique can be either relative or absolute depending upon how we use in most instances in most laboratories gpc techniques are used as a relative technique that means molecular weight measurements are done using a calibration curve which is generated from known molecular weight of polymers it is applicable for complete range of molecular weight of uh, polymers and disadvantage is if we while we use this as a relative technique we need calibration for which we need lot of polymer standard which are no which are basically mono dispersed polymer molecules with known molecular weight we can also use this as absolute technique but for that we need this is very expensive technique and we require more sophisticated instrumentation for this now for this course i will only discuss about the techniques which are of practical utility as of now now it is although these techniques are all available but generally we don't use these techniques for measuring polymer molecular weight nowadays nowadays the techniques which are used very frequently are in group analysis so i will discuss in group analysis i will as a representation from these four i will briefly discuss the membrane osmometry but these uh, four techniques are not very used uh, very frequently but from as a representative i will discuss this uh, membrane osmometry and as this very this is very uh, easy technique and can be used commonly in lab for a crude way of measuring molecular weight or quick way of measuring molecular weight which may not require very accurate result these are used nowadays for quick measurements of uh, approximate molecular weight so i will discuss this dilute solution viscometry i will also discuss light scattering and gel permeation chromatography so i will stop now from next lecture onwards i will discuss this uh, five techniques which i marked now for determining polymer molecular weight